Blizzard's Diablo series is an absolute powerhouse franchise that has sold over 50 million copies in its lifetime. Diablo 3 is actually second to Overwatch in terms of total units sold, making it one of the biggest successes for Blizzard ever. In this video, we're going to explore the ups and downs of the beloved Diablo franchise, and since this is such a big subject that spans around 25 years, I'll have to split this video into multiple parts. I'll talk about Diablo, Diablo 2, Diablo 3, and the sort of darker times for the franchise, I'll also talk about the future of the franchise and the Diablo 3 that we never got. So if you're interested in seeing that, stick around and subscribe. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into the original Diablo. Diablo was originally thought up by David Brevik. While working on Justice League Task Force, he had an idea to make a roguelike game that was single player, turn based, and had permadeath. On top of that, Brevik wanted the game to work like a card game, meaning that loot would be tied to specific CDs that you'd need to buy. So for example, there'd be the Diablo base game, and let's say there'd be a mage loot pack, a warrior loot pack CD, and so on and so forth. Think of a really primitive DLC system. The name Diablo, funnily enough, didn't originate from the Spanish word for the devil. I mean, it did, but David Brevik didn't speak a lick of Spanish. He just thought that the name was cool because he frequented the San Francisco hiking trail, Mount Diablo. After work had completed on Justice League Task Force, Brevik and his team at Condor Games quickly began to work on Diablo. They pitched a tech demo to several different studios to unfortunate results. Diablo was turned down by various studios because according to them, RPGs were dead and PC gaming was going nowhere. Elsewhere, a young and budding game studio, Blizzard, had just completed their newest game, Warcraft Orcs and Humans. David Brevik had seen the game on display and they met with Blizzard, and they were actually interested in Diablo and wanted to help make it a reality. Blizzard had two conditions though. They wanted the game to be real time and they wanted it to have multiplayer. This initially made Brevik uncomfortable because this betrayed the entire philosophy that he believed in at first, and he put these changes up to a vote at Condor Games offices. Thankfully, the changes were agreed upon and the game we all know and love finally began development. David Brevik was actually in charge of converting Diablo to a real-time game, despite strongly advocating for a turn-based experience. According to Brevik, the moment his warrior struck a skeleton and it smashed into a million pieces, he knew that this was the correct decision for the game. I uh, clicked the mouse and the character walked over and smashed a skeleton apart and I was like, Oh my god, this is so amazing. This is so much better. Yeah, this definitely has to be real time. Now, I wanted it real time all along. I remember there was just a magical moment. It felt like the skies parting. God came out and the angels sang and it was like, oh, it was glorious. Unfortunately, Condor had run into some financial issues that would possibly jeopardize the project. Blizzard, however, believed in the Diablo project so much that they actually acquired Condor and officially renamed them to Blizzard North, so that work could continue on Diablo with Blizzard South's full support. Meanwhile, Blizzard South was working on a brand new online game service that they wanted to launch alongside Diablo. It was called Battle.net, and it was going to change the way online games would be played forever. See, back in the day, matchmaking on PC multiplayer games required the use of third-party software, such as mPlayer or TEN, to work. After you downloaded the software, you had to make sure your game was compatible with the program, and then you could browse servers using a primitive user interface. Battle.net sought to change that by offering a more streamlined and seamless experience for Blizzard games. After Blizzard South completed their work on Warcraft 2, they set their focus on releasing Battle.net at the same time as Diablo. But they were shocked to discover that Diablo had no multiplayer integration coded into it as nobody from Condor had any experience in making multiplayer games. So Blizzard South had to move some of their staff over temporarily to ensure that the Battle.net integration went smoothly. Now there's a widespread rumor about Diablo that it was originally intended to have claymation-based graphics, similar to something like Primal Rage or Clay Fighter, but this has been disputed by David Brevik already. It's a rumor out there that, uh, that the game started as claymation, there was a, a game uh, called Primal Rage at the time, this arcade machine, uh, which was a fighting game as well, and they had made all of their 
all of their animations and stuff was stop motion made out of clay. And we were going to do the same thing for Diablo, uh, but it was only for like two minutes. We made one monster, we set it up or whatever. It was such a pain that we said, okay, forget this. We're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna, this is gonna be way too much work. As development wrapped on Diablo, the team at Blizzard North were actually a little nervous about how the game would sell and be received. The team expected around 100,000 sales if they played their cards right. However, they had received a request that possibly changed Diablo's fate for the best. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, gaming magazines such as PC Gamer would include demo discs of games for consumers to try before they bought. This is also where gamers would receive their reviews because the internet and video reviews weren't really a big thing back then. PC Gamer requested a Diablo demo from Blizzard North and they were eager to jump at the opportunity as back then that was probably the best way to get some exposure for your game. The demo version of Diablo has some notable differences from the final release. For example, the inventory screen was swapped with the character stat screens and some of the voices were altered. But the biggest difference was the hotbar, a feature that's now considered a staple in the series almost didn't happen. The hotbar that allowed you to drag potions for quick use was added at the very last moment before Blizzard's release after some user feedback. After the demo had received some positive press, the team at Blizzard felt a little more confident in Diablo and they upped their expectations to roughly 500,000 sales. And they prepared a shipment of copies to match those expectations. Diablo had roughly 450,000 pre-orders, which absolutely shattered the team's expectations. Diablo, enter if you dare. And upon its release, Diablo held the number one spot on the monthly PC games bestsellers for three months before being usurped by X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter. Even then though, it maintained the number two spot up until September. It was clear that this was a massive hit and the game was receiving some overwhelming critical praise from review outlets all over the world. It was lauded for its randomly generated dungeons, amazing graphics, and variety of magical items. The game had 8 and 9s across the board, and the biggest complaint Diablo received was its length. Macworld's Michael Gowen wrote, The only downside to this role-playing game is that the adventure ends too soon. Of course, Diablo was also praised for its revolutionary multiplayer and was seen as the pinnacle of RPGs and online gaming. There was a bit of a thorn in Blizzard's North side though, and that was cheaters. Cheaters were rampant in this game, and they were a huge problem with duping items and kind of ruining the in-game economy. Honestly, this could have been stopped, but this was a changing world. Information was rapidly spreading and becoming easy to get, and cheats could be shared with people all around the world in a way that had never been possible before. After its massive success on PC, Diablo was also released on PlayStation to similar praise, although it was kind of a memory hog. The standard PlayStation memory card was only 15 blocks or around 1 megabyte, and the console version of Diablo was around 10 blocks or around 666 kilobytes. This version of the game wouldn't have online multiplayer, but it would feature a split screen local multiplayer alternative instead, a feature that would eventually return in the future. Diablo's legacy is one of legend. The game frequently is mentioned whenever you're talking about the best PC games or the best RPGs ever made. The game was recently released in 2019 on GOG with some resolution fixes to make it run on newer systems. The atmosphere that Diablo establishes is so beautiful and intense. The game's visuals still hold up almost 25 years later. While other games from that era now look incredibly antiquated, I always appreciate the decision to go for a more stylized art direction than try to go for a cutting edge look with the technology available at the time. Don't get me wrong, Diablo was praised for how amazing it looked upon its release, but it still looks great because of its stylized art direction. The game focuses on a dark and grim color palette with gothic architecture, and it looks so nice. Yeah, the animations and voice acting haven't aged well at all. Now everyone is dead. Killed by a demon he called the Butcher. Avengers! Find this Butcher and slay him, so that our souls may finally rest. But it's got a certain charm to it that makes the game very enjoyable and timeless. 
The gameplay is still so crisp and smooth despite how old it is. Other games tend to age poorly due to advancements in control and optimization, but Diablo still stands tall, honestly. There's some minor annoyances like how damn slow you move when you're in the town, or how there's friendly fire in multiplayer, but that's both hilarious and frustrating. If Diablo was released today, its controls would definitely pass off as pretty decent compared to more modern action RPGs like Path of Exile, Diablo 3, or Wilson. Something that I feel has been kind of understated when it comes to conversations about this game is its sound. The soundtrack being amazing is universally understood. The Tristram theme is synonymous with the Diablo series at this point, but the game's sound design is actually so good. Casting spells, smashing enemies with blunt weapons, and the loot drops all have extremely satisfying sound cues. Specifically with the loot stuff, after playing for a few minutes, you start to recognize these cues. Oh, a sword dropped. Oh, sweet, a scroll. As if anybody has ever said that. This is literally in every single action RPG these days, but it's nice to see the game that popularized the genre set the standard because I feel like it's an important quality of life feature that might not have been thought about if Diablo hadn't done it first. On top of being a really great game, Diablo has a really cool expansion pack called Hellfire. It added new dungeons, a new storyline, several new magical items, a new playable class with the monk, and a ton of much needed quality of life changes like moving quickly throughout the town. It wasn't made by Blizzard themselves, so it's not really supported on Battle.net unfortunately, but I'd say it's the version that I prefer using when doing a single player run of Diablo. Diablo has a long lasting legacy of being one of the greatest games ever made. It set the gold standard for future action RPGs and it honestly still really holds up to this day. If you haven't played this game before, do yourself a favor and check it out. After the massive critical and financial success of Diablo, Blizzard and Blizzard North were quickly becoming the new hotshots of the PC gaming world. So of course, a sequel was greenlit. The team had extremely ambitious ideas for the sequel to Diablo, and we'll get into all of that in the next part of this retrospective series.